First, culture. It's one of those things that means many things. One definition of culture is um, culture versus nature. That means that there is just a culture and it's what we have created rather than what is there by nature. In a way, I'm going to talk about that, but more often you, you'll now hear me talk about cultures in plural sense, meaning specific varieties of things that we create. And this is basically some definitions from different kinds of science. Okay, so first we're going to do a test. I want you to get a paper and pen. Which is also a really good exercise because some of the things while I talk, it'd be probably really useful for you to put some notes in the margins on a paper. So, what you see is four cards. It might not look like cards, but I'm sure you can imagine. And you also see that the cards are numbered with the Roman letters underneath from one to four. Okay? This is a kind of cards that on one side you will find a letter and on the other side you will find a number. Two of these cards we have the number facing up and two of them we have the letter facing up. Now I'm going to give you a rule. I'm going to say that all cards with an even number on has to have a consonant on the other side. Consonant is opposite of vowels. Okay, so any card that has an even number on it has to have a consonant on the other side. And I want you to write down <coughs> the number of cards, which one or ones you would have to flip over to check if this is true. And it's not a trick question, in case you're wondering. Do you want some more time? Hands up. Yes. Can you repeat? It? Yes. All cards with an even number not on has to have a consonant on the other side. And the other cards? Okay, so I'm going to go <coughs> to four new cards. You can see it's the same structure. But I've just done them as cards because it makes it more simple to compare the two. Um, this is actually a bar. In the bar, there's four people. Two of them, we know, th and I should say, there's four people in the bar, everyone has a glass in front of them, and we can't see what's in the glass. However, two people, we know the age of. We know that one is 43 and one is 17. And the other two, we don't know what they have in the, what, what age they have, but we know actually what's in their glasses. We know that number three here is drinking beer and number four is drinking soda. And I'm gonna say to you, all beer drinkers has to be 18 or over. Which people do we need to check? either what's in their glass or their age, of 
if there is any that we have to check. Please write down on your paper which people we have to check. And still, it's not a trick question. Do you need more time? Can I just ask? Yeah? Do you need to check if they have it or if they have it, they do not have it? Well, we have to check if this rule is actually upheld. Okay. Does the rule say that like, once you're 18 or over, you are drinking beer? No, that you can drink beer. Do you need more time? No, okay. So, which one was the easiest? Hands up if you think the first one was the easiest. Okay, hands up if you think the second was the easiest. Okay, a lot of people think the second was the easiest. And do you know, it's exactly the same question. It's exactly the same. We have to check number two and number tri three. Number two, because we don't know what this person is drinking and it's a person who is below the age of where you are allowed to drink alcohol beverage. And in this one, we only have to concern ourselves what is on the other side of number four and on the other side of E. Because if, of course, if E has a, an even number on it, it's breaking the rule. Most people find this one a lot harder than this one. And this is because our human brains have evolved. This is actually evolutionary stuff. It has evolved into a space where we are, of course, with individual uh, differences, much, much, much better at identifying social structures than logical dilemmas. We simply don't think of it like that. We think of it as taboos. And there's very little taboo in our hearts and minds about even numbers and consonants. So why am I starting with this? Because we're going to make playable cultures. And sometimes when you as a librarian sit down and think, oh, I'm going to make the best culture ever and it's going to be completely logical. It's not necessarily going to be playable because it's going to be increasingly difficult for the players to understand and actually get the more abstractly logical it gets. Okay? Cool. So what is a culture? This is a picture from a game called Just a Little Oven. And what they're doing here is a ritual. The game was about celebrating 4th of July, among other things. And at a certain point every day, they roast the flag and played the Jimi Hendrix version of um, Star Spangled Banner. Doing this was a ritual. So a ritual is actions, and these actions can fill a function. <coughs> like, you eat, it fills, normally, the function to sustain you. But certain meals also have a ritualistic feature. So rituals are an important part of cultures. So is language what we call the things we do, which words we use, because words enforce the way we think. If I can't say a sentence in third person without saying uh, which gender the person I'm talking about has, if, if it's not possible to do that, I can't say I went to the doctor and then the doctor told me to do this and this and that, and I can't carry on that thread of conversation without gendering whether or not I think the doctor was a man or female. Then that shows me that in this completely irrelevant case of doctor's gender, it, 
carries a very significant part in my culture. Norms can be the norm that it's uh, these two guys who raised the flag, that doctors shouldn't be um, fighting in wars. We have a lot of spoken and unspoken norms in our society. Like, why are you in the end of the room rather than in the front? I'm betting it doesn't only have to do with visibility of the screen. And also, it's easy to define a culture from the point of what it's not. We are not this and this. We are not so and so. And to create an opposition. And often that, in a way, gives us a, cult a cultural clash or a conflict, which can be a good motivator for play or drama, but I'd like to show you that it's not contrary to what some dramaturgs think, always necessary. We're not agreeing on that one. And a culture should have coherence. It doesn't mean that it has to be logical, like I said, but it has to be somewhat coherent and understandable, at least from the inside. So what is real? See, I'm going to tell you all about the world here. <laughs> so this is a picture from Melan Himelohav. Uh, this is a piece of scenography. It's uh, actually, you can see three, three tents that were then built into the houses, sort of a habitat for that house. And this was when we were doing a light test for the sunlight. So this was uh, midday, or uh, dawn, sort of right before midday light. And we were doing this test. So this is all real. It's uh, the props, it's the curtains, it's the, the thing we used. This is the exact same space, but it's in-game. This is a Sunniva, which is one of the sort of priests, having a, a talk with somebody. In, uh, in this corner, here, it's just the curtain has been drawn. So the things that is going on here is the things that isn't the props. And a lot of that is culture. There's reason that this person is having white clothes and the person, the other person is wearing blue clothes. There's a reason for posture, what we worked with, which we tried very hard to make ungendered or at least difficult to identify. So what is real? <coughs> Suggestions? Something that has some background. Mm -hmm. Alan? The plant is real. <coughs> the plant is real, yeah. That's also a bit, actually a bit of scenography that isn't in that one. Yeah. Emotions. The emotions. Everything that the persons in there treat as real. Hmm. Of course, we can talk about real in two different ways here. We talk about like the real world kind of real, and we talk of the something that is actually happening externally from our imagination. And that's when we get into dodgy area when it comes to LARPing because it feels really real and the feelings are really real, but the stimuli maybe isn't really real. And this is the dilemma in creating a playable culture to me. This is exist sort of <coughs> shown right here. That what we do when we try to make a playable culture is everything but what is in the first picture. And it's quite easy to go from the material side when you want to make a culture. You go like, okay, so where do they live? What's their, 
what is this place? And you try to buy things and, and create things and, and build armor or hand sew clothes or whatever. But those are the external contraptions of a culture. It's not the culture. So rituals. This is also from Melanie Mulehav in Endgame, and it's the marriage of the people. Okay, don't summon a demon. <laughs> Unless you have a pet one, of course. Or built one. Um, and I'm saying this very jokingly, but uh, I've also seen LARPs where uh, LARPers who are not initiated in that specific tradition actually perform religious rites that carry huge significant meaning to others. I'm not saying that if you buy a copy of Anton LaVey's The Satanic Bible and you do an Anokantian thing, you will actually conjure something. But unless you're really, really sure, maybe you shouldn't, you know, go with it, go for it completely. And in my humble opinion, you shouldn't necessarily prefer, perform Eucharist, the um, Last Supper, in a, in a game. It's dodgy, it's tricky, because you will have players for whom this is really significantly not okay. And it can be significantly, significantly not okay for at least two different reasons. One, I am actually a believer, and I find it horribly offensive that somebody who isn't an ordained priest is doing this. Or, I'm an atheist, and I find it incredibly offensive that doing something that has to do with a real-life ritual practice of a religion is something I have to do in the game. And I say prefer rather than never do this because of course there can be a game in which this is negotiated in a really good way where the players have talked about this and where the theme of it might actually require that you do this and then you'll have to talk about it, but do it in a responsible way. Also, when you do rituals, keep it simple. It's very easy to, rem to sort of imagine a, a ritual where you summon the dragon and then you need to build a dragon, which isn't quite easy, or a demon. Or you have all these props and paraphernalia and they have to work perfectly together, and then again, you get into the frame of building paraphernalia rather than working on your culture. So keep it simple. Also, remember your purpose. Do you actually need to have prayer moments every hour? Or was that just a cool thing you had when you wrote it? Because maybe that will actually disrupt play over and over. But maybe it won't. But remember why you're doing this theme and, and do, do that. If there's going to be a story about a marriage, by all means, have a marriage. It would be stupid not to have the marriage ritual in a game that was about that and the after party. <coughs> also, keep it simple because players and not only players, unfortunately, are quite stupid. <laughs> they're also into other things. Maybe they're not into your huge ritual. Maybe that's not why they're going to the game. Maybe that's just like, oh, we're going to play about this marriage that's going to happen and we want to talk about the dowries and we want to talk about all these things. And, and yeah, 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 we're, we're also going to be, you know, marry actually but maybe their interest is in another place use rituals as milestones to tell a story of having a feeling of progression in a story and as helpers to remind of everyday things because a ritual can also be something like the first thing I do when I get up in the morning is I Take a shower, I, well actually, 
I go past the kitchen, I put on a kettle of water for my coffee, I go out into the bathroom, I pee and have a shower, I come back out, I fix the coffee, I put breakfast on the table. And the further I get into this ritual, the more diffuse and diluted it gets. But the first things I do, I do that the same thing every morning. Maybe the first thing I do when I come to work is I go get a cup of coffee and I put it down. And if somebody interrupts me on my way to get the coffee, my whole day is ruined. Rituals can be ways of allowing players to make some parts of the game really easy for them, in one sense, which actually enables them to do other deeper thing in another sense. So for instance, if I know, um, I had one game in which uh, the we had a morning ritual that was far more complicated than my morning. We, me and my um, page uh, had a cleansing thing that we couldn't speak until we had been cleansed. And in this case we had to walk like one and a half kilometers to this beautiful waterfall and wash ourselves in the waterfall. And I must say that during this almost week-long game those walks in silence were some of the most beautiful LARP experiences I've had. Also because of scenic nature, but because it was this ritual and I was processing everything that was happening in my character. So although the action was simple, it was a very deeply uh, special thing for me. And don't underestimate that. Keep what they have to do simple because it gives more room. So communication, and this picture you remember from Halat Hisar. This is a way of doing Twitter. So not all communication is talk. There's a lot of other communications we do. We express feelings, we express class, status. We express all sorts of things when we're talking. For instance, if I would be up here and I would talk to you like this, I would use a more English accent and I would elaborate on different pieces of my work of art to you. Well, you'd fall asleep, that's one thing, but you would also assume other things about me, judging from how I speak. If I don't have the words, it's really difficult to tell a story. So why are we creating all of these faders, for instance? It's so that we can have a common language in which we can actually talk about LARP design. Because if we can't talk about it, it's really difficult. Imagine that I would explain to you yesterday the concept of bleed in, but we hadn't made such a concept and I was just trying to to sort of talk about how we, it's like this diffuse line between player and character. And, and then in the next talk, or two talks later, Jok would try to tell you about safety and she would use a completely different concept. It would just be confusing. So we need words to tell a story. There's also lots of things that can be communicated by other things when you build your culture. Hairstyle. Wearing a hijab communicates things, often, I think, different thing from the person wearing a hijab than from person seeing the hijab, unfortunately. But yes, that's also a way of, of miscommunication, of where you implant prejudice. So remember your purpose, again. Some of these things is going to just pop up and pop up because it's important. Remember what you want to do. Don't complicate the dress codes, for instance, to, to an immense extent. Use simple color, but, let, but sometimes let the players wear sort of whatever, but maybe sort of, okay, we're going to have a different social classes. Okay, you need to wear trashy clothes, give a few examples. And the other class, maybe they need to wear 
office clothes give a few examples of what that means in that culture. And as Johanna said, the more you leave out, the more defaulting the players will typically do. Unless you inspire them by workshops and by talking and by facilitating the content in which they will fill it out in much more creative ways than you could have ever, ever, ever imagined. But if you just leave it blank and leave it up to their, I don't know, imagination, mostly on the site because mostly they haven't actually thought about it before they have to, they will default. Mm. Also think about who and where the communication is for. We might communicate in one way around a, a group in the game in a certain way. For instance, a group, um, people who were in the seventh house in Mellon Himmelhav, they were the lowest case. Um, they were people that were really, really low status. Off game, it was really important to talk about that status and how we treat that and how we deal with that and make sure that the communication around the characters in the Seven House was actually about the characters and not about the players. And it's very, very easy to do that. It's so easy to build negative culture. In a game that I'm planning to do next year, which is partly about gender but mostly about freedom, we are gonna, among other things, go from one notion that all men are animal, which is stated again and again in our culture where women have to wear this and that because men can't control themselves. If you wear a miniskirt, it's like poking the dog and so on and so on. Why is that important when you have rape cases in court? What the women, woman was wearing. And I'm not saying that only women get raped and I'm not saying all rapists are men. But I'm saying that the expression all men are basically more animalistic is a rather strong argument even in Sweden. So if we take that example why not put all men in cages? That would solve the problem. So one of the things is we're going to play a culture where, um, animal, where men has actually been put in cages. So we're going to do this and we're going to talk about this. So we're going to say stuff like, um, uh, well, all the people here, uh, they're either here because they work here or they're here because they uh, want to come and see the producers or or they want to they want to get inseminated and the producers is what men are called because they're only kept to produce sperm so in in that words I just said all the people and I excluded them and if I communicate like that enough outside of the game I will also create separatistic player groups which will not communicate. And that can be a really, really good thing for their LARP experience. You can also choose to do it the other way where they actually have a really, really good connection but in-game you do it differently. Or in Mellan Himmelhav when we said that of course people who are uh, evening people can't, morning people can't partake in the decisions. It's the same thing. And norms. Most of this I've already said, but I'm gonna tell you that a story about a horse. This is the norms, what we do. It's the do's and don'ts, it's what's, if there's an in-game explanation, are they relevant for the story, arbitrary opposed to aware, like what are we really aware of? What do we make ourselves aware of? And who and where is the norms for? 
and again keep it keep it simple because you know you know what a horse is right okay so horses and humans they've looked more or less the same for 10,000 years okay do we agree okay not 10,000 thousand years okay like 100 years okay so let's go back 100 years ago now horses they 100 years ago like in the end of the 18th century they were this big powerful muscular creatures of hoofs and steel and pure and utter like warlike forceful masculine quality and it was absolutely inconceivable to have any women in the stable because this was a man's work funnily today horses are these soft nice friendly creatures with their soft noses and their big eyes and you can cool with them and the typical person you would expect to find in a stable is a girl age 7 to 16 nothing have happened to either people or horses genetically that's culture okay so these are the norms these are the norms that makes us do all sorts of weird things like for instance when you've played uh, the dinner game was there anyone who identifies as a man who actually played the mother one two okay people who played the dogs did you gender the dog automatically no. i think you did because I heard you talk about it you said he about the dog and you said I walked to that lady dog the other player is actually the yes <coughs> hmm? because I was he yeah so is it yeah so, so this I didn't do that but the other players yeah and it's quite interesting isn't it because the dog isn't gendered in the way it's described but you gender it anyway on assumption of the player's gender and the thing is that also you talk about sometimes how it felt to be a mother but it's not defined what it is to be a mother and we know that this has nothing to do with you know carrying the fetus for a long time because it varies in different cultures and this is also a really really part of us and them because I don't assume that everyone in here identifies as either male or female because actually there's a lot of people who aren't like one out of thousand and like on a biological level and much more who don't feel comfortable with the gender roles but it seemed that you chose depending on your off game gender so to speak to a large extent and it makes it easier it's a player norm it's probably because you felt it was the easiest the task wasn't to think about your gender the task was to play a family and you probably felt that you had stereotypes to work from but stereotyping can be very damaging to your vision as a as a creator and think that the more natural something feels, the more you will have to work to change it. That's a good rule of thumb. So it needs to be coherent. It says, people will stop asking you questions if you answer back in interpretive dance. <laughs> Meeting expectations is really important. And you need to decide what to skip, and that's what I'm doing now, so I'm skipping forward a bit. And you need to prioritize. You need to sync with the other aspects that's really important and you need to choose which is the most important in Monitor Celestra it was portraying this culture or non-culture rather to portray the scenography that was the most important and not putting time and effort into creating a culture fine that's a design choice 
And to sum up, the playable culture has an adequate depth. It's complicated enough. It, players have understood it and can internalize it. You have the players, the characters and you. You agree on what you're going to do. And you have a reasonable amount of transparency so that you're actually doing the right and same thing. Because the worst thing for your culture is when the player is getting really, really, really scared that Oh my god, what are they doing? I must have not read that web page. Oh my god, did I miss that memo? Because that creates player insecurity. And if you have players who know about the culture, you can then surprise them in-game. Without them going to that space of insecurity about just not knowing. And this is also from Just a Little Loving, and it's a drag queen in front of a very makeshift stage. And you can see the gaffer tape if you have a higher resolution. But it's okay, because we did that culture. There's some playability stoppers. Information overload. Irrelevant ritual, rituals. Practice or history, like I don't need to know the history of these people if I'm not going to play that. Communication stoppers, like if somebody's bad, they have to go to sit in a corner for half a day. Some people actually like to sit in the corner. Some people would say that's the quintessence of LARPing, <laughs> or at least in a closet, but not all player. So if you do a culture where things end up with people being in corners, it's not going to be good for all of them, or where they have to be quiet, or when they when you escalate, escalate things into drastic things. And this, of course, can be stopped, like in Just a Little Loving, where it was like over total drama queen dramatics. But where we had act breaks, so we could sort of reset characters, form new relationships with the ones we had really fought away. So you can work with that. But think of not just, oh, it'd be really cool if we have this punishment where you have to go out to the desert for 40 days. And then something does, happens like three hours into the game and somebody has to go off to the desert for 40 days. <laughs> so the helpers. Coherent aesthetics. Relevant pre-game <laughs> communication. Play furthering rather than play stopping norms. Sustainable, which can last over the game. Ritualized behavior. Safe rules that m allow people to do what they're supposed to do in this culture. Context to match the cultural expressions. And I'm also going to tell you that you don't have to communicate everything by text. I'm going to a game in two weeks um, where for the first of their games, this is called Grandland 3. It's uh, the third one they're doing it. For the first one, they were just like, oh, we're going to have two armies and they're going to fight in the forest and it's going to be great. Mm -hmm. And they had lots of info on the different um, groups of soldiers and what kind of armor and most of the information was about which kind of buffers and how you could buffer and um, very little other information. A couple of years later, they did a second game, Grönland 2. Two. And for this one, they published a book, the history of this place, with you know the religion, with everything, and it's so boring that even though I'm, I love doing LARP theory, I haven't been able to get through it. And I don't think many players did. And it sort of, in a way, made the game difficult for this third game. They have decided that the most important message they're going to send to their players is that war is not fun. That's the, that's the main thing. And they've decided that they're going to say that there's basically three sides in this conflict. It's the red and white, it's the green and white, and it's the guys that get squeezed in the middle. And these are the three main player groups. 
that's the two, two things they wanted to communicate before the game. And then they have a web page and they said, you don't have to read the book, it obs it's obsolete. And they decided to communicate this. So they did this. <coughs> Birds are holy in this religion. It says voluntary enlistment. That's a playability helper. It gives you an aesthetic, it gives you a clear vision, it makes you understand that although this is a medieval fantasy war game, it's not going to be 
about two groups of people buffering in the forest. Do you agree? Okay. So other, this is basically being co coherent, having safe rules, matching, and also keeping up the awareness of defaulting. Because one of the defaulting when you do, for instance, wargaming in this setting would be that it's just fun. And I know that sounds mental, but that's like I said yesterday. It's actually quite more common that you go to a LARP to get killed than to get a romance. Which sort of sucks. But we can make great LARPs about that too, if we're just aware. Because you know what? The most important thing is that because we practice the tools of building culture, and again, all LARPs are political, we can make little life hacks into the world where we decide to not use he or she, for instance, when we talk, but talk about they, because we know that we build stereotypes by using words. Or we do things in how we tweak our culture or how we imagine the world to be. Because this, my friends, is just the beginning. Thank you very much.